Welcome to The Great Security Debate. This show has experts taking sides to help broaden understanding of a topic. Therefore, it's safe to say that the views expressed are not necessarily those of the people we work with or for. Heck, they may not even represent our own views as we take a position for the sake of the debate. Our website is greatsecuritydebate.net and you can contact us via email at feedback at greatsecuritydebate.net or on Twitter at Security Debate. Now, let's join the debate already in progress. Speaking of stories, actually, do you guys uh, use the secureworld.io? Do you look at their, their news source at all? No. So no they, I... do, they do an aggregation of different stories. And it's uh, here. Let me, I'll send you. Secureworld.io? Yeah, I, I picked up on, so... I'm not sure. Yeah, I remember the old just... secure. I, I remember Secure World, but I've never been to this site. And yeah, I just they got an. In- so I did, and then Industry News. Mm-hmm. I, I was kind of laughing. I would, I periodically look at it. They had one on there. Jimmy Fallon's hilarious cybersecurity jokes. Oh yeah, I'm there right now. This is so funny because I just, without thinking about it, looked it up via Google. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> you you've turned into you've turned into our parents. The whole internet is Google or the whole internet is Facebook. But it, <laughs> where's it's, the it's, E on my screen? E mom? It's uh you know the E. The internet. <laughs> oh Internet Explorer. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but this is this is funny. I mean, you look at the Jimmy Fallon stuff. I mean, I was thinking about this. I'm putting together a presentation that we're gonna do to all of our suppliers this week. And how much security has grown? I mean, well, the but fact it's in the mainstream, s- such that yeah, that you, you're getting jokes from yeah. Jimmy Fallon. He goes some news. He goes some news from Washington today. Uh, the White House hosted a summit with 30 other countries to discuss ways to crack down on hacking and cyber attacks. It was very productive. Every country agreed to fight hacking by adding an exclamation point to all their passwords. One, two, three, four, six, seven, exclamation point. <laughs> Failing continued on. The fact that Russia was missing. That's right. The White House hosted 30 countries to talk about cybercrime, but Russia wasn't invited. I mean, I'm sure they were there. They just weren't invited. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, uh, actually, I think that, you know, the, the, the point is actually really, really interesting that we've made. Um, you know, this field has made it into the broader spectrum. You know, I'm, I'm aware of people that listen to the show that have no place in the security world. I mean, they're not doing security actively, but it's a topic that interests them. It's a topic that they're doing on a daily basis or, you know, that they're experiencing in their daily personal lives, but it's not what they do for a job. So it's, it's really has seeped into everybody's, everybody's everything. Unavoidable. Fortunately or unfortunately, I guess, fortunately, from our perspective, it's uh, job security, pun intended. Um, I'm, but, I'm trying to look up. Governor does not understand hack. Oh, was that? Is oh, that Missouri. the one where they? Yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah, apologies to anybody in Missouri, but uh, your governor has a bit of a has a bit of a challenge ahead of him uh, when it comes to technology if the uh, based on this story why don't you tell us a little bit about it Brian so I was reading more about it last night um, but you have I believe it was several social security numbers that were accessed by a reporter simply by going in I mean it was basically almost like it was public record on the way they went in and were able to view the information. Um, and I, if I understand it correctly, and guys help me out here, I believe that the governor's understanding of what is HTML code, right, that is public versus encrypted or, because um, I've been reading certain funny taglines that have gone along with it. Well, it's, it's that the, 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 the website had you know, the way one of the techniques that's used in modern websites is you push a lot of data that you think that the user will need you preload it down to the browser and so it's in the browser and if you look into the source if you view source or if you um you know look into any of the 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 there's a whole bunch of uh, browsers within the browser that let you see the data that a website is holding 
not on their servers, but what's been pushed back. And in this case, um, you know, the, uh, the, the, the person looked and actually hit F12, which is another way to do this, or right click and go to view source. And you can, it, they were able to see that there were social security numbers that were pushed down into his browser as a user. So he didn't go soliciting for them. He didn't go querying their databases. He logged into the website and pushed it down. I know when I log into certain mobile company websites, it pushes down a list of all of the all of the phone numbers associated with my company's account. So it can have them ready and be able to do stuff with them. And it has all the data associated with them. So my my understanding from reading all this, though, pushing F12 is illegal from what the governor has said. Well, that's based. So if you if you read the, the if you read things like the U.S. Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, uh, any kind of access of of information that you're not supposed to have can be considered hacking. But realize that that law was written in, I think, 1990 um, and hasn't been updated. I think there are state statutes that, statutes that are as, just as old and just as crusty. Um, but in this case, it was the mere fact that the person did something that ended up getting them into, um, into data that they shouldn't is therefore illegal. Now, this is a tap. I'll tell you personally, I do this exact maneuver many times a day. Um, so maybe I'm due for arrest if I go to Missouri too. Uh, but this is, I mean, this is a very narrow and specific reading of a law um, that is way out of date and, and, and needs help. Now, it's been my understanding. I mean, I know in the UK, this has been a problem under the, the CMA, the Computer Misuse Act where security professionals have been able to be charged under that law. Um, and in the U S it seems like most prosecutors have been willing to stay away from it. Like they know that this is not a, this is not the intention of the law. And so they haven't, the governor of Missouri came out guns a blazing for somebody looking at basically what was already on their own system. The data they looked at never, they never left their system to go find this information. And so they looked at it, um, reported it back and said, hey, you've got a problem. Hey, you, you, know, you should really fix this because you're pushing things to me that aren't about me and that aren't things that need to be there. Uh, and the response was, how dare you look at Social Security numbers that aren't yours? So it's a misinformed response to a good intention based on a technique that developers and technology-minded people do all the time in their own browser. So, so should I take this, I have like a little sticky thing over F12 that says do not use. So you can use F12. That's a- <laughs> yeah, yes, <laughs> you, you you absolutely can. Replace that sticky note with your password with a new exclamation point at the end. Um, double exclamation. Double exclamation. Well, now that we've told him you're going to need to put a third. Um, oh. But the, uh, yeah, yes, F12 view source is is invaluable to developers it's invaluable to to average you to any user that wants to understand how pages are written um all it does is show you the same html that your browser is getting from the server so you, you're never leaving your system it's all already in your computer and in in the spirit of can't beat them join them i am opening up a petition on change.org right now to have f12 banned from all keyboards going forward so well that's unfortunate because didn't apple just come out with uh, computers with actual physical key physical f keys this week oh did they <laughs> yes I didn't, I missed the that. new macbook pros i have actual physical function keys nice. uh, if they had stayed they with the fair- touch bar we could uh, we could just it, we could uh, block it in software but uh in all fairness though this isn't a new topic i mean this has come up at the federal level before they've talked about at some point banning hacking tools that many of us use on a daily basis for testing you know, mm-hmm. we think I, I'm going to go nerd on this one, but as it, as it relates to looking at the source code and website, how many of us have opened up Burp Suite to proxy a website to see what's going through? Absolutely. Of course. And that's not just a security. It's the same thing with what you were saying, Dan, that, you know, developers use that as well to figure out, well, what's going on? Why isn't my site? Why isn't this working? So it's, it's nothing new, um, but this is a long line of misunderstanding of the actual field. It's the same thing that, you know, with talking about different news stories, there was one, I don't know, a month or two ago where somebody, they were contemplating holding CISOs, um, actual accountable for some of these, these breaches, um, person on a personal level. And it's, 
So that interesting, yeah. interesting dynamics that come out of misunderstandings of, of how things actually work. Yeah, without question. And then that last piece you did is um, the last piece you mentioned on accountability is a really interesting one um, because we've gone to we've already gone to the point of holding CEOs accountable for certain things like this and for fiduciary items, even if they're even if it's out of their control, you know, you, the, the, it all rolls up to the top. Same with boards of directors. Boards of directors are now uh, members of boards can be held personally liable for things that happen either financially or security wise within their organization um, that they're overseeing. So I guess it, I guess it's not in the everyday world. It'd be really bad to see CISOs held accountable for these things. But at the same time, it then gives you a license as a CISO to not necessarily act accordingly, knowing you have some kind of immunity or knowing that you don't have implied threat to your personal life. It's a, it's a really interesting balancing act. Right. The, the struggle I have with that though, is we, as we go back and take a look at Enron, right after Enron comes Sarbanes-Oxley. And now we're talking about accounting principles, which are hard rules for accounting, how you will handle your books. Those are finite rules right? Those are strict guidelines. Financials are pretty black and white. Security mm -hmm. to me is not black and white. It's a nonlinear prog uh, program. It's, it's, there's much more to it. It's, there's also an, it's almost like there's an, an aspect that's infinite, right? There's mm -hmm. infinite number of attacks, vulnerabilities that are coming out. There is no predictability to what we do other than the fact that there won't be any predictability. That's the only thing that's predictable. But there is negligence. Yes, but that's when we get into the legalese. And that's why you talk about negligence or gross negligence. I'm fine with some of those aspects, but mm -hmm. I don't think those have truly been defined yet in the court system, <laughs> yeah. what that looks like from a security perspective. No, it doesn't I, even I mean, begin to be defined. We could look at a pipeline and everybody, it's, there's a million different definitions of what they should have been doing, what actually happened there. Um, and now you and so, I breathe while Brian says what he's been trying to get in for the last five minutes. <laughs> well, no, no, no. You, you, you touched on two things because one was when you guys talk about accountability, one thing that I thought was funny was in all of these articles, there was one I read that said, furthermore, the only one that should be brought to justice is the state for putting social security numbers in HTML in the first place. Mm -hmm. And the only one purely, purely playing politics appears to be the governor. And then Eric, you mentioned CISOs being held responsible um, and, or liable, not just liable is the board. Liable. Yeah. Um, it's as businesses move and this goes back to the governor and his understanding or lack thereof, right. How his network works, how his programs work, what's on his systems, how data is pushed one way versus this way, what's visible, what's not visible, how the cloud is used as companies move more and more to the cloud, more and more, if you want to call it edge computing and everything else, the, the tools that are being purchased and how those are being configured aren't necessarily security tools. <laughs> those, those are business tools that the business is buying, okay? And if you look back at security for, let's say, a manufacturing plant, typically these were security guards. They wore badges. Some of them may have had guns, right? And there's a fence around the perimeter, right? And that's physical security. If, the, if some plant operations shut down because they bought an automated machine, they don't go blame the security guard outside Right. Like, oh, the, the machine shut down and, and I'm getting very far fetched here. But the reality is the business is buying tools today. Business is moving more and more A to the cloud, buying software, putting systems in place, moving faster. And lo and behold, it becomes, is it security's job to understand if everything's configured properly? If different, you know, as three buckets are left open, visible to the public, because this is going to go into another conversation of a very large organization that I was talking with. And we were having kind of a side conversation as we finished lunch. And he said, you know, tell me your thoughts on this. He said, Brian, we're working with the company that we're planning on hiring. That's going to go in to basically do those searches, see if you have different doors or windows unlocked. And then they're going to see if they can scrape some data that has certain key indicators on it, right? That could be the CEO's name attached to it, right? Could be the word, um, you know, confidential, right? Mm -hmm. Search for these different things and see if you can actually find or pull information without doing anything necessarily illegal. And I, he goes, 
I go, but is that legal? You know, just because you left your door unlocked, is it legal for you to come on into my house and take pictures of my documents sitting on top of my computer? Or Are they doing it desk? against their own organization or against a, not the different organization? They're doing it against their own organization. Well, then in theory, they have the right to do so if they're being granted the right by the comp by the organization. <laughs> Right, but in the the conversation though, on, on uh, yeah, they are, and he said their legal teams are talking about it. Like, there's certain data though that obviously the, if the company's coming in to do so, that taking pictures of etc., that data is being hosted now. Like, they have this information. Where are they hosting it? So he goes, "There's this much longer process of figuring out. Yeah, they're going to do this. They're going to look for it. But if they find something, where is it? And do, do we get all of that back? How do we guarantee that we got it back?" Right. Like we want to know, but are we sure we want to know? Because what happens if we find out we know and then they have the information, but we don't get all the information back. And it was, it was kind of a very long winded conversation. But mm -hmm. to this exact point, Dan, um, the governor saying, you know, well, you have this if you go back to the term hacking or breach or, you know, this 1990s law that was written and you have this information that's not yours, but you didn't obtain it by breaking in the front door but is it legal or illegal to do that you left something open and i just happened to be looking into it and i found this right um I, a bigger conversation got a little long-winded there but <laughs> you know for the number of security professionals that could be held liable because of all the new tools a business is buying could you make could you actually make an, uh, an argument there that it's actually blackmail essentially you planted the evidence in their browser. And then when they said, Hey, I've got this. No, you stole it. It's like planting <laughs> evidence in somebody's car. It's yeah. So here, so they welcome to the nuance of the CFAA. Um, you know, the, the, the rule basically says, you know, whoever having knowingly accessed a computer with, without authorization or exceeding authorized access, it real oh, sorry, knowingly and with intent to defraud accesses a protected computer without authorization or exceeds authorized access and by means of conduct furthers the intended fraud and obtains anything of value unless the object of the fraud and the thing obtained consists only of the use of the computer and the value of such as not more than $5,000 in any one period, you know, so there, and there's a whole set of other things, but it really is any un inappropriate or over access use is, is potentially, you know, is potentially hacking. Well, and it's a, uh, it's, it's such a broad title. And if you think back yeah. to, you know, to 1986, 1986. That's a very different world in 1986. Very different. Yeah, that's well, war I mean, games think, era. Right. You think back to Brian's analogy on the, the door being unlocked. I think that's the line of demarcation on, on testing, right? That it's okay to, to walk up and say, hey, your door's unlocked. But then if you take that step in, now that's where you've crossed the line, right? Well, and then the, it's become even more complicated over the past few years. Um, there's been an ongoing case between LinkedIn and um, I can't remember the third party. I'll find it and put it in the show notes uh, where this third party has been scraping visible information from LinkedIn site. So they're not breaking into systems. They're using publicly visible information. They're scraping it. They're collecting it. They're reselling it. Um, at last... And I, this has been going back and forth a bit, but I think at last blush, they got the okay that it was okay to do so. That that type of scraping, if it's publicly visible, you can take it um, and and do with it. Now, of course, I think LinkedIn, which is now Microsoft, have gone back and turned around and said, you know, and, and filed another appeal. But um, but at the last ruling, and it's been a couple of back and forth, is that this was okay. So, you know, depending on where and how you put it, maybe it isn't against the law. But back to, I want to go back to what you had, um, you know, you had talked about the, um, you know, dip within the organization. And if you have a, you know, if you have a part of the organization that's doing, it's not security stuff, it's business stuff that's happening. Um, and the question, I, I guess the question is about monkeys on, you know, whose monkey is on, whose back is the monkey on on this? Is it, you know, we've spent a lot of time over the years as you know in, in various leadership training and various you know other discussions talking about making sure that the monkey that we as security teams don't take the monkeys off of everyone else's back that we don't let them put all the monkeys onto the security back just like you would say you know security we need you to accept this risk 
No, that's not quite how it works. It's rather that, you know, that we can inform about the risk, but we're not accepting risk for the organization. It ultimately is a, you know, it needs to be in the context of the business value of the business um, of the, of the, you know, put the risks in terms of the benefits and make it a, a, an informed decision about how the business wants to proceed. Um, and that's the company, the organization as a whole, not just a particular business area. Um, and in doing so, we try to keep those monkeys from all piling up on the back of on the back of the information security team. Um, I think I see this in a same in a similar way in that we don't necessarily we can't have you know security can only do what security knows about, and we should have tools to you know to understand the network. But there's always going to be, and I think we've talked about this in past episodes. Water will always find its way through. You will have a um, you know you'll have a part of the organization that goes to a third party marketing firm to create a website. It may not even be hosted on your network. It may not even be hosted at the same place you have, but it might have a domain um, that, and oh, it might not even be in your domain structure. I've seen it where it's, you know, company name, newcoolproduct.com. It's not even just come under the company.com name. Um, You know, those are very hard to find. So I think it comes back to setting the culture in the organization so that people know the rules and know how to approach them, but at the same time also giving them an environment where they want to, where they want to be able to ask the question and come back and say, is this okay? Not that they'll feel penalized or, you know, or, you know that there's a punitive response uh, to asking those questions so that they'll want to ask them and they'll want to get the advice on it early because it's the right thing to do for the company. So, Dan, how many people do you think are going to reach out to security and ask them if they can use the F12 key on Monday? Oh, I, it's already been I've, it, it's been the joke through the course of this whole last week. Um, I've had five different five different people ask me about this. That's good. Yeah. The other thing I was going to note, too, and, and when you read through the definition, and that's why I, I threw some notes out there. A lot of the definition refers to a computer. Um and the difference between a computer and a server. And then when you talk about the server and the cloud, and then you talk about how people are able to view people's information through a cloud server, which simply is just another server, just maybe not on your premises and somebody else's premises. Um, and I, I haven't gone through all the, the readings of terms of service, et cetera, whether it's AWS, Google, et cetera. Um, but I find that, for as fast as software development is changing and growing um, and features are being added in and, you know, the cloud didn't exist in 1990. You could say it did because you had a server, but in terms of the cloud and how you use somebody else's data center or server, et cetera, and the tools that now come with it and applications that you can use really weren't there in the 1990s when these original laws were written. Um, you know, who benefits from that? And I'm not saying it, it, there's a reason to not update them because somebody's looking for a benefit. Who benefits from them not being updated, such as said governor could possibly benefit from laws not being updated, although the term and the w- wording of the use of hacker, uh, in this case, it was not hacking that the person achieved getting the information. But ultimately, you have some re- really old laws out there, and the way things have changed as fast as they have, unless somebody's really rewriting the laws, and Dan, I think you're very familiar with politics, Eric, you as well, things don't necessarily move fast in politics. So as one law is written, it could almost be <clears throat> said that it almost becomes outdated by the time it goes into practice if it's in relation to technology. So we have to be careful how we're writing these laws. So there's a lot of benefit to big business to have on Capitol Hill, their people lobbying for certain language to be added because they know what technology is coming in the pipeline because they're developing. it. They have two year, three year, four year plans and those things will change. But there are definitely reasons for them to be out there lobbying for certain laws to be curtailed or certain language to be curtailed or for certain language to be added. But at the same time, 
Yeah, you know, so yes, I'm, I I know politics does play in, but at the same time, politics also plays in when you can be the person that helps make it happen, make something that's long overdue happen. We did see in the UK that the Computer Misuse Act, uh, it was announced earlier this year, is going to be updated uh, for the first time since 1990. Um, you know, I know people that have been that have been prosecuted under this law for being security practitioners. That's the other part that they don't talk about is that just being security practitioners, you are at risk uh, in both the U.S. and the U.K. under these laws. Um, but the you know you can also use politics as a reason to um, to want to change them and update them for the modern era. But that said, you know laws are hard. Laws are hard to write today, knowing that the lifespan on a law is multi. You know, it, it's a decade at minimum, before you can go and get it changed. And trying to think about all the eventualities, it's a frightening thing. Um, you know, to try and write a law now in 2021 that will be not just useful, but not harmful in 2031. Just think back to 2011 and writing things then that would have been would have been not just you know useful and not harmful to inadvertently harmful today. Um, you, you mentioned, you know, Sarbanes-Oxley, Graham Leach-Bliley and other laws. They're written, they were written at the time and there are components that have been found to be very difficult over time. Um, so I know a lot of people just shy away from, well, it's, it's there. We'll just, we'll figure it out on the prosecutor side, meaning we'll have prosecutors decide not to prosecute under these things or we'll agree not to, uh, you know, not to pursue these certain parts of it. Um which is a different challenge under how laws work, but um, but reopening a law also then invites a lot of lobbying, a lot of interests. Um, you know, I, I think I like to think that that's a lot of reason why things like U.S. privacy law and uh, regulation of social media and other really hot topics aren't happening as quickly because doing so opens the floodgates of now infinite amounts of money and um, and passion around from lobbying and i don't know that people enjoy going into that process well unless you're the lobbyists of course do lobbyists make money dan lobbyists spend money (laughs) yeah yes lobbyists make money Hmm. lots of dinners drinks sounds like a new profession i might look at lobby (laughs) security lobbyists there you go securing security lobbying from automotive to security to security lobby, the yes. bottles of wine just keep getting bigger. I suspect that's already there as we go back to our last podcast and what we were talking about with insurance companies changing and technology being dictated and all of that. That that lobbying is there. Yeah. Maybe even who we saw that was picked to be at the White House to be opining on some of the directions in cyber regulation or direction. You know, one thing too that you guys sparked curiosity. I was thinking back to this only because one, we're in the state of Michigan right now. Eric, you do work for an automotive company as a CISO, and liability. It just in my memory, I went back to go look. Um, I think his name was Paul. I'll have to pull this up. Paul Whelan was the CISO for Borg Warner, who was arrested in Russia two years ago. And I just was looking to see if he had been released. And it looks like like end of October, you know, he appealed for his release, but I don't have anything that shows that he was actually ever released. What was Um, he held for? Espionage. They, they said he was a spy. Yeah, that that story was a while ago. Now I'm forgetting the details around there, but that that was major news, and then all of a sudden, kind of dissipated pretty quickly. Yeah, was found, and I don't know. Found guilty know what's and tr- sentenced to 16 years in prison. Yeah, it's tough to know what's true and what's not true because you start digging into the stories and the information about it, um, and there's not a lot of news about it here, and the information that they found on him, you know, the the accounts that they found under his name and so forth. But you look at the knowing the industry that we're in for if somebody wanted to set up without you knowing about it, an account somehow tied to you like a social media account and then create a fake name for you or an alias with information somehow tied to you. 
those things are not that far fetched. And if you have a group that wanted to do it to you, that's well funded, that can very easily be done. Right. And then it's the burden of proof falls back onto you when you're in one of these other countries, right? Like, we'll prove that you didn't do it. You don't exactly have a lot of resources at your disposal to be able to do that. Right. Like it, it, it does make it very difficult. Um, so I, I was, that came back to me in terms of, and Eric, I'm not saying don't travel ever, you know, do not land in another country as a CISO because you could be held liable for something <laughs> you're not even aware of. I'm um, not going anywhere now. <laughs> well, it, I mean, it, it, it is an interesting construct, whereas previously CEOs were the visible one. Um, the heads of information security are becoming more visible. You're seeing names and you know information available in um, in press releases. You're seeing you know CISOs be being used more in marketing material for a company to reinforce the message that security is important to that company and that how that they're you know how they're approaching it. Um, the CISO is becoming a much more visible role, and therefore. Um, yeah, I guess it's not it's not hard to see the leap from that to um to to target. Uh but I don't know if it I don't think it's a widespread activity yet, but at the same time anybody is anybody is a potential target these days. Right. I, but it actually got me thinking, Brad, when you said making up a fake persona on somebody. I mean, we've seen some of the deep fakes that have come out. It's absolutely amazing now. What you can what you can make it look like somebody said or did, and it's impressive. <laughs> then who who's the the lady from Forest? Yeah, I was just going to talk things. Renee Murphy. Yeah, uh, she's every got Friday, some incredible ones every Friday, <laughs> every Friday on her LinkedIn. I don't know if she puts it on her Twitter too, but uh, on her LinkedIn, uh, Renee Murphy from Forrester does deep fake deep fake Friday, where she injects her face into many 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 different. Uh, photos and the um the, the, the it's so natural and it feels so real when you look at it that you do start to question everything you see yeah i i thought that was pretty incredible um, so now is that considered hacking under the current laws manipulating data in and for what use was it intended well <laughs> <laughs> prove my intention brian <laughs> exactly um you know one thing that i in eric this goes back to um the the jimmy Fallon jokes that you brought brought up i feel like if more people watched uh that jimmy Fallon episode um or skit which in for those that are listening this was jimmy Fallon jokes about white house Cybersecurity summit um it maybe gives them the first taste of, of really, un, I wouldn't even say understanding security, but in terms of like, there's a lot out there to be talked about. And he jokes about how, you know, since Russia wasn't included in the 30 countries that were invited to sit down for the cybersecurity summit, and part of the summit was around curbing ransomware. And he jokes that I don't think Russia would have stayed anyways. As soon as, soon as Putin walked in, he'd be like, is this intervention? No way. No, I'm not going to stop hacking. It's not a problem for me. I only hack when I'm drinking. <laughs> and I, oh, boy. And, you could, and, and granted, I, I mean, our, our podcast is probably now because of this, probably outlawed in Russia. Not that I think we had a ton of Russian listeners. Well, that'll get more listeners then. <laughs> <laughs> the best thing you can do is get banned, right? <laughs> but it, but this weekend you saw too. So around a lot of conversation around ransomware, we talked about it last week, right? Um, in the conversation, what just happened to our evil or revel, depending on what people refer to the ransomware gang as um, looks like they may have been taken offline again through a joint effort of a few countries working together. One of which was, the United States of America. And right after that, Conti came out with a, a kind of a public statement, kind of slamming the U S for taking one of their brothers in arms offline. Um, and, and why we are hypocritical to their business and what they're doing. Um, so it's, it's, I say that laughing because 
you have a ransomware gang complaining about how we took somebody else offline. But this goes back to the conversation about offensive techniques. And it was a government doing it, but they're saying, well, you took a business offline. <laughs> but your your business was extorting other companies. But note they didn't but, say a legitimate business. <laughs> right. Yeah. And and we've had the conversation before about, you know, what would happen if companies themselves started to become more offensive mm-hmm. um, rather than always being on the defensive. Right. And I think that's where it also pivots to and Eric, you being, you know, a cybersecurity leader for a company, you fall into the risk of, you know, persecution, prosecution, you name it for maybe going above and beyond what your right. actual job is. That in itself, I mean, we could spend a whole podcast, I think, just going through that, the the whole idea of of hackback. Um, but I, I feel like that line has been drawn now by the, the U.S. government, that they've made that clear that that's reserved for them. And I mean, whether they drew the line or not, as I look at it, if you look at it on the international scale, what some of these countries are able to bring to bear, the, the skills that are involved. I mean, look, we've got a really, really good team, but we're not that good. And um, even if and, you and are, it, even if you are, you know, JP Morgan Chase or you are, you know, Walmart or the biggest companies in the US, it is hard to compete against nation states. Yeah. Especially on a on a turn on a turnaround. You get re offensive. Um, I don't know that I'd want to be on the other side of it, but the legalities as well. Now you are committing a hack. Right. Are you right. is it okay to do so? And that's it's the the phrase I commonly use with the board is somebody out there always has more time, more money, and a higher technical skills, right? If they want to get in, they're going to get in. So our focus has still got to be on those trip wires, on catching them quickly and shutting them down. I, I just don't see companies moving into a position at some point where we're, we're trying to hack back. I mean, you're literally engaging now in kind of active cyber warfare with an organized crime, and that's what they do for a living. Mm-hmm. You know, there there was a good meme that I I'll have to I'll have to pull up, but somebody had written down on a, a notebook piece of paper, you know, what the attackers have to do today, what we have to do today. And under us, you know, we've got to have meetings, we've got to do all of these <laughs> things. They have one thing, one thing that they have to do yeah. and that's break in, right? Um, it's stacked against us. So I don't me personally, I don't want to play that game. <laughs> I don't want to get into to a battle with somebody that's doing this day in, day out. Now, imagine that you're a very well-funded multi-billionaire who owns a, a company that sells goods, distributes goods, maybe is located. Bruce Wayne? <laughs> Wayne Enterprise. You could kind of make it like a Bruce Wayne, right? I, I was thinking more like um, starts with an A, ends with an S. I don't know that I'd put Bezos and Wayne in the same, uh, in the same breath. <laughs> but, but now you because have... only one of them's been to space. This is true. No, hasn't <laughs> been to space. Has been to his own definition of space, but I'll leave that for the, for the actual space yeah, people to talk enough. about. But now you take a very, very well-funded individual and the fact that you were the target in, in proliferation of information and data using um, a hacking tool called Pegasus by a specific government and individual. And that government and individual has a boatload of money as well. I mean, I'm not saying that there's something going on there, but I could see somebody taking something very personal and you could set up your own team, not even located here if you wanted to, to hack back. Yeah. Or just assume that the that somebody from your own from your gov cloud would have hacked back and just launch it yourself. <laughs> so I I mean I put it out there, right? And I it, and I don't think CISOs and I'm not saying I'm not speaking for the CISO community. But I don't think CISOs are, Eric, to your point, in a position where they, A, have the funding, have the resources, nor would they want to engage in that because they have a broader and bigger job, which is protecting the business, right. not creating cr- creating the attention of the attackers to want to do more attacks to your business. Yeah. Right? right. And who knows? Maybe that's the next market, offensive security as a service. <laughs> Right. Please no. Then it's gonna. <laughs> you get, th- now you're, you're now get we're into. Gonna, now we're into. Be- you know, Wyatt Earp world, and 
I don't know. That I, was, I, I was actually going to go blazing saddles <laughs> with uh, creating badges for everybody. <laughs> yeah, but but if you if you think about it too, though, the the number of operations um, outside of cybersecurity, just military operations that have been carried out over the last ten to fifteen years, where it's third party organizations being hired in that are ex military, right, mm-hmm. to carry out specific missions for the government. Um, it, they're not necessarily replacing Navy SEALs or Marines, et cetera, but in certain combat situations they are, and they're being asked to go in and do that. Um, and it, it's not U S soldiers that are doing it. I very much could see in the future and maybe it's already happening. Right. And I'm, I'm not here to assume that it is or is not that there are very intelligent people out there that the government could you know, you could be a offensive cybersecurity team as a service and you get hired out and dropped into different areas to be able to operate. And when I say dropped into different areas, I'm not saying directly into the combat zone, (laughs) but maybe a location that has less punitive measures for doing things rather than (laughs) operating directly out of the United States. Right. Um, I'm just saying, I, I, I wouldn't put it that far out there for something like that to a either be happening or happen in the future. Yeah, I'm right there with you. And I mean, heck, it may be happening today and we're just not not aware of it. But as I see it from from my perspective as an organization, that our game is getting better at avoidance, right? That, you know, if we look at it, we've built our security controls internally and that was resiliency. But then as we start pushing out into gaining threat intelligence, getting into dark web monitoring, getting into those 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 aspects, now we're getting better at avoiding before that shot comes across, before the punch is thrown, right? Our job is not necessarily to throw a, a counter punch back. That's just not the game we're going to be in, but it's going to be more and more compelling. I mean, if we go back, let's look at what's being, that's going to play out in courts with, and I forget what hospital it was, that we may have seen the first death associated with a cyber attack now. Um, I, it, 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 it's like story, looking but... at like a DDoS attack, like you just said, like if you just have your eyes closed and allow someone to take a five step drop and punch you in the face, you're probably going to get knocked out. But if you know that at some point something like that could be coming and now you can see it coming and you figure out how to absorb it and then push it back without right. taking all the impact directly here to you know the frontal lobe, um, you live to fight another day and you do it right. with minimal impact. I do. I do think this is going to continue to get worse before it gets better, though. I, I mean, the the story I was referencing. I mean, that's just one of. I think we're going to see many to come I, I, as we look at the the. I'll call it the attacker community, right? Um, I don't think there's any target that's really off limits, and that's going to start pushing some buttons that really hit home. That we're we're no longer just talking about systems going down, inconveniences of of gas pipes, inconveniences, of mass transit being down. I mean, we're we're starting to talk about actual lives now. And as you start moving into actual lives, now we are actual talking warfare. Um, There there are, I mean, there are big, big ramifications. And this has been part, this has been part and parcel to some industries for quite some time, including automotive, including, you know, and I, I, I had come out of the, out of the, the the pharma pharma and medical device area, where that level of um, that level of attention was required, because you don't always get the device back. You can't always you know patch it later. You can't always um, or well, even when you can patch it later, sometimes that can be the vector. But there's you know, there when death is on the line, when human life and uh, is on the line with the actions you take, you tend to take them a lot more cautiously. Um, and I think it would be interesting to watch that mindset extend to other businesses that may never have thought that human life was in their hands. It's true. That's true. I mean, that, that's one of the things that we're contemplating. If you talk about, you know, industry 4.0, connected machinery and all of that, I mean, it's not too far to fathom that if you, I mean, let's go all the way back to Stuxnet, right? I mean, if you look at that was still a long time ago, but you're talking about a, a physical attack on centrifuges, turning them up and down, spitting them up just a little bit to destroy them. But now you transition that same lens and put that on an arm that's moving parts. Mm-hmm. So what could you potentially do with that? I mean, you know, having watched some of those arms move axles around, that's a lot of power sitting there. That's. Yeah. I mean, it's this, 
Same thing with like, if you took, say a bridge, that drawbridge that opens or closes, or even a train where you can move it off the tracks. And if you did it just at the right time to derail a train traveling at X amount of speed, right? Um, there's those use cases as well. One thing I was going to throw out there, and this was just on the funny side, because I am looking at some of the write-ins that we had prior to uh, getting on today. Um, and it's just, I think the, the understanding of security, it, there's people are talking about it more and more, you know, like, like friends, family asked me, you know, Brian, oh my gosh. They're like, you know, you're, you're in cybersecurity now. Like it's gotta be crazy. I was watching the news. Right. And it's, it, yeah, but it's like, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not the guy out there like fighting ransomware attacks. <laughs> like they, they just hear that I'm in cybersecurity and it's immediately like I am Batman out there crime fighting middle of the night. Um, so there are actually people are reading about it more, listening to it more. It's becoming a bigger conversation. Um, but then Eric, I, th- I think it might've been you put out there spam. Is it a food or is it email? Right. <laughs> you know, and if you say the word spam to somebody in cybersecurity, the first thing we think of is email, right? Well, I There's think these certain- days, if you say the word spam to just about anybody, it'll be email. I think Hormel is really, really taking it on the chin with this uh, <laughs> over the past 10 years. I think it's become a more common term associated with email than with pink gelatinous food. But I'm no marketing genius, but I feel like if you created a commercial around spam, right? Like spam email, like, oh, it's another one, honey. Oh, it's another one. Then you open up the fridge. Well, at least this spam is still here and you you hold it up. Like people would joke about it. You get spam memes and, and gifts. And before you know it, everyone's talking about spam and now it's just showing up on your feeds all the time. What's the name of your creative agency? Come back. Spam sushi would come back. Spam yakitori would come back. Um, spam yak. I mean, you put it out there. There's so many different things you can do with this thing called spam. Threat actors do it all the time with. Can you do the same thing with how many different ways you can cook shrimp? Oh, (laughs) you really want me to run through it? (laughs) Don't I? So I would say don't sell yourself short. I mean, when you're talking about being in cybersecurity, because while we may be selling to boards and executives, you are still trying to sell to a lot of organizations that don't believe they need certain technologies and need to be doing certain things. Uh, that is extremely tough in itself. Um, you're, you're selling understanding, which yeah. is, there, and is, it's is funny. Difficult. And you're selling to the individuals across the organization who should be doing, who need to know this in, in for their everyday lives. Right. So what, one of the, one of the newer members of our team, and, and for the listeners that are on, I, I do work for a vendor, but one of the newer members to our team, um, we were just talking la- uh, middle of this week and we were on a call. And after the call, we had met up about two hours later in front of a group of people. He goes, man, I am just so surprised at how many times we'll be on a call. And the person we're talking to says they're the only person in security at the company and the company could have literally you know, 5,000 endpoints, right? Like, Mm -hmm. and, and I said, and did you hear what the person had said? Like they were just hired in six months ago, you know, because there was an issue last year and the issue was around ransomware. So they hired one person, that person's supposed to build out a team. And the first question I asked, and this is just now knowing to ask the question, do you plan to build out a team? You know, are you looking at one to two people or are you looking at building out a team of four to five people in different groups, you know, and the typical response is I have a plan to hire one to two people. That's what I've been allotted. Right. That's not a lot of people. Right. And that goes back to saying, if you hire a security guard to guard, you know, the perimeter of your building, but the perimeter of your building is only maybe, you know, 300 feet. That's not a big deal, but if the perimeter of your building spans seven blocks and you got one person in charge of watching all of it with, you know, a hundred different entry points, it's a pretty difficult job to task that person with. Right. Hey, I would caution though. I mean, that's, that's the one problem. It's an imperfect science as we look at comparative metrics to understand where, where, how do you compare one security program to another, right? Mm-hmm. Is it number of people, percentage of budget? Is it... All of those are so Dan Ayala, it depends, right? 
uh, it's it's tough because what what you could be missing on the, the flip side is maybe they're an organization that's using a lot of services that I've got an outsourced sock. So I'm going to use that for elasticity. I can ramp it up, ramp it down as I need. And then I'm not playing the hiring game. Um, and then that, that gets into the, the fundamental views that, that we have on building internal team versus external team that we can save for another day. Um, but it's, no, and, and that's a great point. Cause that's also one of the questions we ask as well. It, prior to asking if you're hiring X number of people, what are you currently doing today to, you know, to manage say your sock or to, to manage. Right. Um, and, s- and typically they're using some type of outside services. Some places are, some places will say it, our IT team has been the ones managing it. And in some cases it, it, it depends on when, your information security program started in the organization too. Um, I have uh, one of the uh, one of the organizations that I'm a CISO for um, asked me a few weeks ago, and this is actually a conversation we're going to have with the board with the, their board of directors this week. Is when is the right time to start an information security program in a smaller organization? Um, and the you know, and of course the answer is it depends, but the um, but the earlier you start, the more embedded it is in the organization's fabric, the less people you need to run it down the road because it becomes a distributed function because right. it's, you're not, you know, I don't need nine people to go and retro back 10 years of bad code that needs to be updated. I don't need, you know, it, 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 it you, there is no single metric to it, but I think the, the better question is at what point do we be, do we begin in earnest dedicated focus on information security in our, in our program, in our organization and start the program? And to what extent do we, do we interweave it into the, into the ethos of the company rather than layering it on top? This is security by design. Uh, and that comes at an organizational level as much as it does a product level. That is such a great point because you're looking at it from the perspective of bolt on versus built in and you want built in as much as you can. Yeah. That's been the most rewarding part for me for the last couple of years is working with with these smaller organizations that get that security needs to be part of it, either because it's a, you know, it's something that is core to the type of work they're doing, uh, or it's a it's a competitive differentiator. And starting these things at an early level, at when when an organization is 10, 15, 20, 30 people, um, it, it makes all the difference. It's so much easier. Uh, to start to get these things built in and then the, the benefits amplify over time. So the right time to start a information security program is now or three years ago. And I had a moment of silence there for a second as I was trying to read, read an article to try to offer insight back in, but I hadn't got all the way through it. I, I stopped too soon. Are you saying I didn't ramble on as normal, as long as I normally do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Dan, you, you, you've been in a great position to, you know, what, what coming from working for a large corporation, not just one large corporation, but to be inside two different enterprises, building out different functions amongst the security team and building out a security program then to go in and do that for smaller corporations, right? Um, and not necessarily smaller budgets, but but you could say at times when you look at the budget of a smaller corporation in terms of what they're trying to accomplish, it doesn't always mean that their budgets are smaller. They actually might have a, a, a larger perspective or need for security and understand the job that you've done explaining it to them, right? Because at the end of the day, Eric, Dan, you guys are in sales as well. I think we talked mm-hmm. about that earlier. Part of going in and, and getting approval for projects is getting the budget and the spending, and that's getting money, right? The same thing that, say, a vendor does when he goes in to sell a product, try to show the value of it, and that's what we're asking you to spend on it. But your job is kind of twofold to go in and do that beforehand to get the approval for a budget. Um, and part of that selling the business on what the risk is, um, not always what the return on investment is going to be you hope to see that return on investment and you explain it in such a way that with risk mitigation, you know, it's like quality control or production control, right. But how you're protecting the business interest, right. And typically business interests, especially boards and, and top management, it's like, and now that ransomware and other things are top of mind, the ability to show how you can accomplish those things makes you someone that's in selling. Mm-hmm. Right. 
Um, but you get to do it now from the level where you're doing it from a your own business, you know, from a VC so standpoint, but to really show the business why it's important, build the team in there. Um, and, and the team is now being embraced by the company because you've helped establish why they're important. So when you leave, it's not, you, how am I trying to say this best? You're leaving the legacy behind. It's like, you, you know, you, you, your son turned this age, you gave him the keys, congratulations. And now he's out roaming the world, checking back in occasionally. Absolutely. If I do, if I do that right, I, um, I work myself right out of a job and, you know, get them to the point where they're big enough and ready to hire a, a larger information security team, their own full-time chief information security officer. Um, and then uh, you turn it over and say, you've, you, you, we've built good bones here. Now go, uh, go continue the good work. I think that's the same for any CISO in any organization as you want to start to instill that uh, deeply within the organization, back to that, back to the fabric of the organization, the ethos of the organization, and you weave it in. Um, the question is, at what point, you know, is it still while you're while you're shearing the wool out of, off of the sheep that you can start to weave that in, or is it that we have to go put some reinforcement into the sweater after it's already been built? And wow, that's an ex- that's yet another of a horrible analogies, uh, <laughs> but I think <laughs> well, it. I think it makes sense. It does. And then I think you could take a step further and you tie it all the way back to many podcasts ago. We talked about, you know, Forrester came out with a different type of CISOs. Then you start from an organizational perspective. You start to recognize who you need at the moment. Do you need the builder? Do you need the maintainer? There's different roles that each of us play within organizations. And to be honest, we're not, many of us are not good at all of them. Many of us don't want to do all of them. Many of us love just building and then we're going to hand it off. And then there's some out there that love, I'm going to take it. And now I'm going to run even further with it. And that's nature of the beast. And different organizations need different types of CISOs, just like different business leaders, just like yep. different practitioners at different stages in their lives. Um, and with that, we have uh, run out of time. <laughs> we're come to the end of another uh, great security debate. I don't know that there was so much debate today, but there was a lot of great discussion. Um, there was debate on F12. Dan, that's and true. I'm that's not convinced true. I can use it. That's true. And I won that debate because I saw Brian take the sticker off of his, uh, take, take the, uh, the sticky note off of his F12 key. Um, but thank you for listening. Thank you, Brian and Eric. Uh, I, I, enjoy these discussions more and more every time. Uh, and thank you for listening. We really appreciate you and your feedback, uh, which you can provide. Uh, you can email us feedback at great security debate.net. Uh, you can leave it in your favorite podcast app along with maybe a rating or a thumbs up. If that's the case, uh, we have a YouTube channel. It's uh, also great security debate. It's the same, it's the same great podcast, but with video. Um, no, we don't have like animations and other things talking, describing what we talk about, but uh, it's another way to, uh, some people enjoy video. They want to put it on their Apple TV and they want to uh, you know, just watch it in the background. So that's there too. I'll put a link to that in the show notes as well. Um, if you, our website is www.greatsecuritydebate.net and on Twitter, we are at security debate. Thanks so much, and we'll see you again soon for another great security debate.